be sure and get a bulletin and uh, <clears throat> be sure and get a bulletin and you'll be able to follow along with me. But if you don't have a bulletin, if you'll just stay at Second Thessalonians chapter two and verses two through twelve. <clears throat> you'll make it just fine. Uh, because of time, I, I won't be able to go very slow. I, I'll have to go through there because there's so many scriptures. <clears throat> I, I want to tell you a story, and it's a true story, and I'm not very proud of it, to tell you the truth. I don't want you to think bad of me when I, when I tell it. My oldest son, his name is Jeff, my oldest son Jeff and and myself have watched the same television show for the last eight years. It is the Curse of Oak Island, and it's on Thursday. I mean Tuesday night at eight o'clock. And what we do, we watch it, and and they just give you enough to bring you back the next week. And, and supposedly the uh, show, supposedly there's a buried treasure on Oak Island and, and it's from the tempers of France or the Portuguese or who knows who. And they have dug that island up. <laughs> and so every week, every week, my son and I watch that. Now if we happen to miss it, then we you know, record it and watch it again. But Every week after that show, my son, and this has been for the last eight years, my son and I talk to each other on the phone. Well, oh, look at what we found. Look what they found. Look what they're going to find next week. And, and, and I think next week they're going to find the main treasure. You know, we, this goes on, on and on and on. And his wife, her name is Amy, she sent me a picture. This is several years ago. <laughs> And this picture is of this skeleton in a caption. The skeleton sitting on a couch, and the in the caption under it, it says, "Jeff and Tim waiting for the treasure to be found on Oak Island." <laughs> and I'd say that's pretty factual. That, that's pretty factual. And I, I'm beginning to feel like I'm under a delusion. You know, I think there's a treasure there. I think they're going to find the treasure. I think I'm being deluded. Paul, in writing his second letter to the church at Thessalonica, he's correcting their misunderstanding. He's correcting from his first letter their misunderstanding of his first letter that Jesus was coming back um, soon. In, in fact, right away, and some and had stopped working. Uh, they had been led astray by false teaching and on this and a lot of other subjects, including adding the old law to the gospel. Just on and on. These false teachers had led others to believe to reject the Word of God by their influence that they had. They did not love the truth of God's Word. They wanted what they wanted. How much have we heard that today? They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They took pleasure in wickedness. And God sent them a strong delusion. And some version calls it a deluding influence. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. The, the lesson's based on this. And I will be talking about things, but, but the lesson's based on this. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, or delusion, King James, so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who do not believe in the truth, but took pleasure in righteousness. So I want us to cover in the next few minutes, I want to cover verses 2 through 12, so we'll have an understanding of this delusion, and, and I want to be able to look at it and answer some questions that I have, is what is the strong delusion? Why did God do this? What does it look like? How can we avoid it? 
So let's look at verses 11 and 12 in different versions that you may have. You heard me read to you in the New American Standard, a diluting influence. Now listen to the New King James. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. NIV. Let's hear what NIV says. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion that they may believe a lie and that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. The simple English version. This is why God sends them a deceiving power so that they will believe a lie. Then all people who do not believe the truth will be condemned. They enjoyed sin. So when you compare this, these versions, you compare this delusion and you see that it is called a deluding influence, a strong delusion, a powerful delusion, or a deceiving power. There are some who are not willing to receive God's Word, nor do they have the love of the truth in His Word so that they may be saved. Instead, they put their faith in that which is false, made by man. So in refusing the truth of God's Word, they prefer instead to obey or disobey God and make their own way. So God gave them up to the power of deceit so that they may be condemned. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But you see, we all have free will. And by free will, if we just continually insist over and over and over, year after year after year to disobey God, He finally lets us have our way because of free choice. You want to believe a lie? Believe it. So let's quickly look now at verses 2 through 12. Verse 2 says, Quickly shaken from your composure. Some brothers and sisters in Christ at Thessalonica were upset by these false teachers, and they had been convinced that either they had missed the second coming, or Jesus had already come, or His coming was imminent, so they quit work. Paul told them in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. No one knows when He comes. Only God knows. Not even the angels in heaven or Jesus the Son knows. He'll come like a thief in the night. But something first must take place. When He comes, all will know. Everybody will know when He comes. It won't be any secret. He's telling them in 2 Thessalonians verse 2 that they're quickly shaken. They were acting like they had lost their senses. They had, been, they had a disquieted state of mind. That's what I call it. A disquieted state of mind. They were upset. They couldn't understand. They misunderstood Paul. So Paul warned the Galatians just like this, just like that, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8, But if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you have been, what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And not only did he say it one time, he said it two times. And this is exactly what happens to false teachers who believe their lies even in Thessalonica here who claim to be Christians. Verse 3, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, a great falling away. And the man of lawlessness this is revealed, the son of perdition or destruction. Oh, you get scared when you look at that. They were surrounded by all these influences that were trying to lead them to error and delusion and unbelief. And now listen to me. This is all the work of Satan. This is all his work. And we see, we see teachers are teaching and they, they were deceived and they're teaching and being deceived. 
Paul warns them not to be deceived. Jesus was not coming until there was this great falling away. And listen to me, this comes within the church. It doesn't come out of the church. It happens in the church. Paul said goodbye to the Ephesian elders in verse 20. In 20, uh, uh, chapter, Acts chapter 20, verse 29. I know that after my departure, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you. That's in the church. And not sparing the flock. From among your own selves, he says, in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Pretty scary, isn't it? I might point out that this has occurred. This has all occurred. Jesus is coming any day now, any point in time, whenever God chooses. The principal foundation of the great falling away is to assume that they have the right, people, man, has the right to change or modify the laws and commandments of God. No, you don't either. The same as many today that do this thing. And you wonder, where are you getting this stuff? They got it from themselves. Remember this man of sin, the son of perdition. He didn't come during Paul's lifetime. In fact, it was uh, after the passing of all the apostles because they were holding this, this process up, this, this force. This principal force was beginning, but it wasn't in full force, and it will take centuries for them to come out in the open against Almighty God. They want to set aside God's orders, God's commands, and establish their own, and eventually that leads to ruin, and it leads to destruction. That's what perdition means. It means destruction. It's why Jesus called... Uh, uh, Judas, the son of perdition. John chapter 17, verse 12. Let's go on verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Who opposes and exalts himself. Listen to me, this goes on today. This goes on today. He displays himself as being God. Now think, you know, we think of the Roman Empire. Uh, emperors wanted to be worshipped. They said they were God. So that some people say it's a Roman Empire. This principle and this latter person exalts himself over God and the worship of God. Now, you could think of a lot of organizations that do that. But listen to me. It's only by the power of Satan. It's him. It's him. This organization, there are many organizations in our world that take God's most sacred right to make laws for his kingdom. And God je jealously guards this right because it's the foundation of his claim to be God. And they, here they are doing this. It requires a, the great authority of God only to repeal or change His laws. He made those laws. We don't have the right to do that. Someone who claims to have this right and authority to change the laws of God to deceive people, exalt themselves, and they are an opponent of Almighty God. They are against God. Whoever claims a right... And you think about it today, there are plenty. Whoever claims the right to legislate to the children of God is trying to exalt themselves against all that is God. They're trying to unseat Almighty God. They legislate for the church of God. They think they are. This man of sin is a power for sure backed 100 percent by satan some say you know I, you know you've heard people say who they think that is it it's the pope it's the emperor nero and but i know who it is for sure <laughs> because i don't know who it is so i know but I, I do know who's causing it and that's satan satan it's the influence of satan what a powerful influence and I know that we're going to be alert. 
we're to be alert. We're to be ready. No matter who it is that's opposing God, we're to be ready. Whatever force, whatever organization, whatever person, it doesn't matter. We're to be ready. This type of thinking was beginning in parts during Paul's lifetime and the other apostles. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, and you have to watch the words here. We're gonna, he's going to identify Satan's work. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, that's our time, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to what? Deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's Satan's work by means of hypocrisy, of liars, seared their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Yeah, we know, we know some of those organizations, don't we? It sounds familiar to us. Verse 5. Paul says, remember I told you these things. This principle, the spirit of lawlessness, was beginning in Paul's day. And this principle was developing in different stages of growth. It's easy for us to trace back and see religious organizations that are made by man. We're able to do that. We can follow it. Or we can look at the Roman emperors and you can trace them back. They thought they were God. It's all this terrible things through the ages, all the way to people being uh, claiming they're infallible, that they hold the place of God on this earth. You can trace that all the way back. But you know what? Whatever force that is, its character assumes the right. Now, this is their character. They assume the right to change or modify in the order and the appointments of God. That's what they're, they, they assume they have that ability or that power to legislate for the kingdom of God. And where this is found, that's the mystery of iniquity where this type of an attitude is found. Here's what we need to know. That, that's always my concern. <laughs> what do I need to know? What do we need to know? This is the essential character and work of Satan. That's what we need to know. Whenever men in the church try to add to or take away, I'm talking about the church when they try to take away from God's Word or add to, are they going to make their own organization on how you worship God? You know, you go to Fort Worth, you go to Dallas, and, and, and you, hear, you see these congregations, and they, they have two services. One is contemporary. Is that us? Contemporary? I wonder. That's not us, is it? That's 76 trombones, isn't it? Yeah. And then you have... Traditional, maybe? That's what it's called. Yeah, that's a... Listen, that's driven by Satan. That's an evil influence. That's deceitful spirits. That's doctrine of demons. That's sin. Whenever men in the church add or take from God's Word, and take from the laws of order that God ordained, that's where the man of sin is at work. That's where it is. Verse 6. And you know what restrains him now. So that in his time he will be revealed. All of these false authorities of the man of sin, you see, in today's world, man thinks he has the right to change everything God has said and commanded. And so you see all these religious organizations that take out baptism, 
They take out faith. They take out everything you can imagine and add back what they want. I think I'll take some of this. Oh, I like some of that. I'll add that. I'll take away that. Oh, yeah, that's what I'll do. And that's what's been going on in our world. All of the false authority of the, of the man of sin is being restrained by the apostles. But when they are taken out of the way, they have free course to develop. And it starts to manifest itself in the church, in, inside, by the order of worship, in the ordinances of the church, and making societies and organizations. For a time, it seems to add to the beauty, and people say, oh, that's lovely. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I have to, I, I, that's pretty good. But it isn't the truth. People think it's okay, that it looks great. But in the end, it's like a parasite. It just saps the life out of the church. Right? Because of all these things that they come up with come between God and man. God's will place churches his church, as independent, distinct congregations connected only with other congregations by bonds of faith and love. And substitution by man of the human order destroys God's plan. When man has to get, thinks he needs to get involved, it destroys God's plan, and it's against the will of God. Consolidation of all the churches into this one religious organization is in rebellion against God. Results in ruin of the people of God. It breaks our sense of responsibility to God. It's the mystery of iniquity, and it's... They try to sit in a seat of God, and it'll bring ruin sooner or later. Listen, the truth is, the truth is, it's the Lord's church. It's not a man. He doesn't belong to him. It's the Lord's church. And God is the sole authority through the Word of God that He gives us that's infallible. And we become Christians by His Word, and He automatically adds us to His church by the obedience of his gospel and we wear one name we wear Christian that's it that's what he wants anything we add that's man you want to call it something else here in town that's not man I mean that's my man it's not by God verse 7 Paul says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's trying to develop. And Paul tells us, watch out. They claim to be the absolute sole authority of God in their work and worship of the church, but they're not. God is the sole authority. God is sole authority through His Word. And he goes on to say His followers his, follow His instructions he is as followers of Jesus Christ. In verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed. When the apostles are go gone, then this poison will take off. And it has. It's taken off today like we've never seen. And you know who's going to bring an end to it? <laughs> Almighty God. He's going to bring an end to it. He's going to slay it with the breath of His Word in verse 8 and verse 9. At the judgment, they'll be, we'll be destroyed. His coming is, a, is a, according to the works of Satan, verse 9, with power and signs and lying wonders. These things are all false, verse 9. And those who disobeyed God, who knew the truth that did not obey, hinders the truth in unrighteousness and they will suffer the wrath of God. Romans 1 and verse 18 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. There is no more dangerous condition to be in, verse 10, than to know the truth and hear the truth 
and reject it or refuse to obey it or make your own way. Those with hardened hearts are going to be condemned. Verse 11 and 12 that we studied. For this reason, God will send them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in unwickedness. Those who have been deluded from the truth, the truth will be judged by God. And they knew the truth. And they refused to obey the truth. And the meaning of the word delusion is a false belief. It has no existence of fact. In fact, the word occurs ten times in the New Testament. Make you note, I think I have it in your outline. A delusion means straying, error, wrong opinion. And we see this term used in Ephesians 4 and verse 14, when a doctrine, trickery, scheming. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, error, impurity, way of deceit. 2 Peter 2, 18, arrogant, fleshly desires, error. 2 Peter 3, 17, error of unprincipled men. 1 John 4 and verse 6, a spirit of error. Jude 11, the way of Cain, the error of Balaam, the rebellion of Korah. I'm pretty sure you get the picture. I'm pretty sure. I want you to think about this for our day. Why does God send a strong delusion? When people who know the truth want to believe something else and they refuse God's Word over and over and over and over until finally they not only are the teachers deceiving others, but they have been deceived themselves. They believe in a lie. They got them going. And on and on and on it goes. That's different from what God reveals. I want you to think about this. It's then that the Lord allows a person, because we have free will, to have what they want. If this is just what they want, if they want to reject me and, and disobey me and they want to try to change my commandments and they want to change my order of worship or my type of worship or they want to change my worship altogether they are, and it goes on and on and on and on then the Lord allows that person to have what they want because of free will and He gives them over to the power of deceit. I don't know about you. That's a scary prospect. They put their faith in that which is false. In the many hours of studying with Darwin. You know, I told you I spent seven or eight years with my, my son and I. Oh, Darwin and I spent every Tuesday. <laughs> we had a Tuesday class, but he'd show up two hours early. So we'd spend two hours. We did that for about seven or eight, seven years, I know of. And he showed me a scripture one time that fits this. I want you to look at it. People who think that God's way is not right. They don't think God's way is right. I can, I, they think they can improve on it. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 29 and 31. Ezekiel 18, verse 29 and 31. But the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not right. God says, Are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is not your ways that are not right? Verse 31. Cast away from all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? You're going to die because you want to have it your way. That's what we have to watch out for today. When people want to have their own way, instead of following what is written in the Word of God, then this delusion process begins to work in our day. 
those who do not desire to do the will of God, God withdraws His knowledge from them, and those who only want to do a part of His will. Now listen. They only want to do a part of His will. They want to leave the rest out. They don't want to look at that. And I've wondered and I've wondered and I've wondered over the years how come God permits only a partial knowledge of His Word. And this explains to me why so many people in this world who profess to be Christians seem never able to see all of the Word of God. They only see the portions. They refuse to look at it all. They refuse to accept it all. Listen, it's His Word. It's not ours. And so when, when those who desire to do just a part of the Word of God, and you try to show them the whole part of the Word of God, but they can't figure it out, this is why. It's because God has has permitted them to have a partial knowledge of Him. Now that's scary. I had that. I had that partial knowledge until I was 20 years old. And I thank my God every day for a little girl right there who showed me the whole truth, who showed me the complete Word of God, it didn't leave nothing out. I had never seen that stuff before. This explains why so many people today who profess to be Christians seem never able to see only a small portion of what they want to see. They have no desire to do anything else. The only thing they see is what they want to see and what they want to do. And blindness is part of having this delusion. This is what is happening to them. They are being spiritually deluded. A delusion. The Lord has revealed clearly if His will, His will if we open up our hearts. But we have to open up our hearts. He gives us everything pertaining to our salvation. 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man may be adequate, a man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. Seeing His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. He is given His will by commandments. He has organized the church, His church, not somebody. He has told us to assemble on the first day of the week. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. Sadly, there are so many today that have been deceived. They think that they don't have to do that. They think I can show up once a week, once a month. I mean, Christmas, Easter, that's good. They've convinced themselves of that. They're being sent a strong delusion by, the, by Satan himself. He's also said what kind of music he wants. He doesn't want 76 trombones. That's not what he wants. He wants our voices. He wants our heart. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Colossians 3 and verse 16. The Lord's Supper is taken every Lord's day. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. And on and on and on if we would just obey Him. He has spoken His Word on how to become a Christian. He told Nicodemus, listen to me. In John chapter 3 and verse 3, He told Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That whole chapter, chapter 3, is about the new birth. But there are those that take one verse, and we know the verse, verse 16. 
John 3 and verse 16. And the truth is, that verse is what God did for us. He sent His Son into this world to die on the cross for us because He loved us. But the whole chapter is about the new birth. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then he told his disciples before they ascended into heaven, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, go to, into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. That's about as clear and and. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> That's clear. God's Word, He's not beating around the bush, He's telling the truth. And if you can't see that right there, you've been deluded. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He didn't just make that up. That's a command of God. And you know what? The apostles did exactly what He said. <laughs> They did exactly what he told them to do on the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon. In Acts 2, they're preaching to them, the people. They were responsible even for, for taking the life of Jesus Christ, hanging him and nailing him to a cross. And he accused them of that. He told them that you have crucified the Son of God. And then people got excited in verse 37. They were pricked in their heart, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And they said, what do we do? We believe. These were believers. And they knew they needed to do something. And He told them what to do in 38 and 39. Repent and each of you be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for this gift. Is, is for you and your children and all that are far off, as many as our God will call to Himself. That He calls us by the gospel. You know, the apostles didn't beat around the bush. There's no delusion there. The only one that deludes themselves is people in the world who want to say what they want to say. And that's sad. There's an absolute war going on today with Satan. The church has always been attacked by those outside the church and also been attacked by those on the inside. The battle on the inside is terrible. Instead of doing exactly what God says, they find themselves trying to justify their actions, having two services, 76 strong bones, and on and on we can go with no divine authority, by the way. Matthew 7, verse 19 through 23, Jesus says every tree that does not bear fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits, and not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we not cast out demons? in your name perform many miracles, then I'll declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't know about you, I don't want everyone to hear those words, depart from me. I never want to hear that. You see, that's a nightmare, an eternal nightmare, to just pay no attention to God's Word. I want to close this lesson with the Scripture. 1 John 5, verse 3 and 4. 1 John 5, verse 3 and 4. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So if you are a Christian, are you faithful to God in your life? Or are you just filled with just your own justification and your own excuses? If you're not a Christian, we're asking you to come by believing in Him, repenting of your sins, and confessing that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, and then live a faithful life to Him. Don't walk away. 
Don't walk away by being deceived. Because that's what he'll do. He will deceive you. We can help in any way this morning. Why don't you come while we stand and sing?